Serpents from the Garden of Eos Portion 1 Lord Set Goes to Hell Episode A Eon of civilized human society starts some 12,000 years ago in a cavern somewhere in the Egyptian deserts near the Nile Valley. The great discoverer of agrarian crop harvesting was a priestess of the serpent goddess Isis. She lived in a cave with the rest of her tribe and likely discovered the planting of crops because of some observation she made while gathering varieties of wild nuts, weeds, roots, and berries which the tribe liked to eat. Centuries may have passed by before the tribe learned to utilize their new crop growing technology well enough to rely upon it as a primary food source. After that, farming and hunting were both complementary and competing economic activities within the social structure of the cavern. Before this, there had been separate societies of hunters, gatherers, and scavengers composing the tribal organization, but this had not produced any dissension in the cave because the hunters provided not only the tribe's meat, the hunting society gave it a ready defense as well. Prehistoric timeline showing the development of tribal religious societies between 100,000 and 12,000 years ago during the late Paleolithic. The societies of the serpent and the vulture were not competitors for the tribal leadership that was exercised by its male hunters. Uranos, great Anu, the sun god of day, was the horned chieftain of the natural world, and his totem family was subordinate to him. The night goddess of earth was his powerful co-regent, giver of life, and the creatrix mistress of animals. This though was a mythic arrangement, and in point of fact, the horned hunter society had the final word most often disputes due to its additional warrior role. The primitive political organization of the Cavern tribe sufficed for many thousands of years of cave life while the embryonic society of stoner humans developed into its first religious and social groupings due to the need for rudimentary economic specialization and the increasing use of language for community cohesion and identity. Neolithic Timeline showing the development of the Solar Hunting Society Lunar Setian Serpent Society and the Solar Avian Society. At some point in the late Paleolithic, between 100,000 and 12,000 years ago. The discovery of wheat planting and harvesting by a sister of Isis, a 
eventually brought about a boom in the growth of the cavern population, and some numbers of Eornos were required to build nearby artificial habitations due to limitations on dwelling space inside the comforts of the cave. As the centuries passed by into a millennium, the settlements outside slowly increased and expanded into more distant territories and locales. This map of Egypt shows the most likely location for Aornos Cavern, somewhere in the Fayum Oasis nearby Moeris Lake. Expanded into more distant territories and locales. Neolithic Egyptian weed growing settler expansion 12,000 to 8,000 BAS. Spread of wheat growing, date first used by settlers. Aornos Cavern, 10,000 to 12,000 BAS. Mainland Egypt, 10,000 BAS. Crete, 9,000 BAS. Hellas, 8,400 BAS. Sesclo Tribe, 8,400 BAS. Katal Huyuk, 8,400 BAS. Impreso Tribe, 8,400 BAS. Caranovo Tribe, 8,000 BAS. Starcebo Tribe, 8,000 BAS. This produced greater and greater difficulties for the society of hunters who found that the herds of wild cattle and gazelle were becoming less large and more scarce, and that this was so even as the villages round Aornos Cavern were becoming ever more populous with farmers tilling the fields of the serpent. Meanwhile, the hunters had noticed a definite precipitous decline in the popularity of their god, Anu. The horned hunter of day was no longer venerated as he was in the days of yore when the ancestors hunted freely upon the land. Snakes of earth had been hatched, and they commanded worship from the depths of their dark cavern where tis of horned gazelle and cattle were offered up in bloody sacrifices to their new lord Set and his thirsting mate, the demonic Isis. Rocky crags above the village were now a blackened and ruddy mall, bright gleaming in the abhorred rays of Uranos, great Anu, who must turn his very sight in disgust from such a reeking altar of offering above, and what lay beyond the rites of blood and lust abomination 
held far within the shadowed corridor chambers of the serpent. Near Edfu, in southern Egypt, there has been found the relics of a most ancient battle between opposing groups of stoners. The site is the location of the world's first conflict between humans that has been unearthed so far. Arrowheads, spear points, and Celts from the skirmish were located close by dozens of human skeletal remains showing mortal wounds upon their bones. Many of the skeletons had severe wounds to the skull. This archaeological find is dated much earlier than the proposed eon of agrarian discovery made by Isis. Here, the relics of the battle and the remains from the resulting massacre have been approximately estimated to be of an era near 20,000 BAS, although this seems much older than likely possible for agrarian discovery. There was also found with the remains of those massacred many stone grinding tools for the preparation of wild cereals, weeds, and roots of various types. There does not seem to have been a pitched struggle, as not many remains from the opposing battle party were found. The earliest Neolithic relics in Egypt come from the Sahara Desert region, not far from the Nile Valley. This area of Egypt is very productive finding new Stone Age deposits because its arid lack of rainfall and scarcity of water and human habitation have helped to prevent the obscurance or alluvial coverage and drift of artifacts. Thus, while in the valley of the Nile very ancient artifacts are difficult to find due to alluvial flooding, the nearer Sahara doesn't have this difficulty. And at the start of the Neolithic in Egypt, at approximately 12,000 BAS, the Sahara Desert received more rainfall than it does today because of climactic changes occurring with the shift from the Pleistocene to the Holocene geologic period. It wasn't a huge change in rainfall, but for several thousand years this part of the Sahara Desert near the Nile was fertile enough to allow for humans to dwell there along with their newly domesticated cattle. It was even then a region of scrub grass plains dry enough to prevent wild cattle from grazing there, although the hardy gazelle did find it pleasant enough. The stoners then, not long after the rains increased, started making seasonal cattle drives from the valley out to this nearby scrub region during the then higher stages of Nile flooding. The only remaining difficulty with this more remote grazing of the cattle must have been the more scarce amount of scrub grass and water in the region. Except for the desert gazelle, large hoofed beasts still found it impossible to graze there, unassisted as they were by human herdsmen. Therefore, due to the scarce and patchy occurrence of scrub grasses on this arid savanna, these first cattle driving herdsmen must have supplied their cattle with some type of additional feed.
the society of these herdsmen was the same as, or very similar to, the old Cabian, Badarian, and Nequata cultures that lived along the Nile River from 9000 BAS to 5000 BAS. These three Neolithic societies were agricultural and did their farming in the fertile alluvial soil of the valley. Nequada is the more advanced society of the three and flourished during the 6th millennium from 6000 to 5000 BAS, preceding the dynastic period unification of the upper and lower kingdoms. Badarian is an intermediate stage of Egyptian Neolithic civilization that existed in the 7th millennium BAS. El Cabian or Corunian lasted from 9000 to 7000 BAS and is the earliest stage of the Egyptian Neolithic in the Nile Valley with enough artifacts and remains preserved in its alluvial soils allowing the determination of agrarian crop tending as a practice of the society. Pre-Dynastic Egyptian Artifacts Pre-Dynastic Egyptian Artifacts Dynastic Egyptian Artifacts The Flinders Petri Chart of Nequata Pre-Dynastic Pottery Types El Cabian Corunian lasted from 9000 to 7000 BAS and is the earliest stage of the Egyptian Neolithic in the Nile Valley with enough artifacts and remains preserved in its alluvial soils allowing the determination of agrarian crop tending as a practice of society. Quarunian Timeline Showing the position of the Quarunian tribe at Lake Moeris at the very beginning of Neolithic agriculture from 9000 to 7000 BAS. The largest excavation site in the Sahara is at Napta Playa which is a settlement of these herdsmen some 150 miles from the Nile out in the deserts west of Edfu. Napta Playa wasn't founded as soon as some sites in the near desert since it was a permanent settlement established later. Although its main economic activity was also cattle herding, there have been numerous finds of stone grinding utensils for the preparation of plant foodstuffs, and these same grinding utensils have been found at every site in the Sahara from the earliest to the latest. This desert region was first utilized by the Egyptians after the climate became wetter at the start of the Holocene, some while after 12,000 BAS. The 
ranchers and herdsmen of Stone Age Egypt made cattle drives between the Nile Valley and the nearby western deserts for a period of some 7,000 years, that is down until about 5,000 BAS when the climate again became drier with the end of the prehistoric eon. Ranchers and herdsmen of Stone Age Egypt made cattle drives between the Nile Valley and the nearby western deserts for a period of some 7,000 years, that is, down until about 5,000 BAS, when the climate again became drier with the end of the prehistoric eon. Perhaps the most remarkable discovery at this large settlement in the near desert was the find of a megalith stone circle temple used for religious rites having to do with the sun and the moon. In appearance, the stone circle looks to be like a simpler and more miniature version of the stone circle at Stonehenge. The similarity in materials and the shape and arrangement of these temples makes for a ready comparison of them. The date of construction for this temple circle has been estimated at 7,000 BAS or earlier placing it in a period equal to the late Elkabian or early Badarian stage of the Egyptian Neolithic. Besides the temple circle itself, there have also been found many other megalith rocks and cromlechs at other sites in the desert of the Sahara. The serpent priestess discoverer of seed planting was then an Egyptian, and she most likely lived in a cavern somewhere upon the western side of the Nile. This sister of Isis made a revolutionary insight concerning the life cycle of plants at some momentary instant nearly 12,000 years ago. The religion of her tribe in this latest eon of the Paleolithic had already developed to a considerable extent, having a creation myth and a primordial pantheon of deities within the natura of existence. These gods were grouped together in four matched pairs of male and female that composed a theistic family, similar to the later Enneads of Heliopolis, Anu, and Hermopolis, Kamenu. Hermopolitan Ennead of Kamenu. Heliopolitan Ennead of Anu. Atum, the creator, solar horned hunter god of day. Nu, the creatrix goddess of night and the watery abyss of stars. Osiris, god of the dead, lunar hunter god of night. Shu, the 
god of air and fire. And Tefnut, the goddess of dark waters. Geb, the god of earth and soil. Set, serpent god of the crop fields. And Isis, serpent goddess of the crop fields. Nephthys, vulture goddess of death and life. The eldest parental pair of this first Paleolithic pantheon, or Ennead, was composed of the god of day and the goddess of night. The god of day was the horned hunter of the sun. The goddess of night was the huntress of the moon and the stars, the mother of life upon earth. The god of day and the goddess of night may have been superseded by an even more supreme god of ultimate neuter unity, the eldest pair of day and night being the male and female emanations of this unity. Nature and Kepera are the names of this ultimate god of unity and being later myths of the Egyptians, although it seems impossible to determine if such an advanced theological belief was thought of in the Paleolithic. So, it is very difficult to determine if the first pantheon of the cave dwellers was an Ennead of nine gods, like later ones, or whether it only had eight gods. This is because the idea of an ultimate god of unified being is such an advanced and abstract conception, there are not many mythic or natural objects that can be linked with a prehistorical idea of such a god. In later myth, Kepera was the one god that had created the day and the night, and the sun and the moon. The god was thought to be metaphorically like the scarab beetle that buried its eggs in a round ball of dung. The scarab's ball of eggs was thought to be similar to the sun, in that the supreme one god of being had first created the sun as a sort of giant round ball of energy from which to form the subsequent portions of creation. The sun was then the egg of energy created in the abyss of watery material night, and every later thing of existence came from the solar energy source of potential being, once it had mixed with the inert matter of dark night. Since the Paleolithic Ennead must have included the serpent and vulture deities because of their domestication, and both of these totem creatures hatched from eggs, it seems probable that the scarab beetle form of a god of ultimate being, that is Kepera, was a part of the mythology even before 
the discovery of agrarian science. Either way, this first theoretical Paleolithic Ennead is very similar in structure and composition to the later ones written of by the priests of Anu and Kamenu. And both of these later Enneads were supposed to be based upon the most ancient mythic texts then known to the Egyptian priests of that later dynastic eon. In the later Enneads, the god of the sun had union with the night goddess and produced the next pair of deities. And so far, the mythologies of the gods and creation are almost identical. The next pair of deities are the god of light and the goddess of the dark, except that in later myth this goddess is merely given as a goddess of the waters and moisture. The god of light is here named as Eros in the myths of the tribal cavern. Eros was also a god of fire and warmth, as well as the god of twilight. He, Eros, obviously took these attributes from his father, the sun god of day. Eos, his sister, was the goddess of the dark and the waters, including moisture of every type, such as dew, mist, and rain. Eos was a goddess of the dawn, as Eros was of the twilight. Eos received her attributes from her mother, the night. sibling deities of Eros and Eos were almost exactly equivalent with the gods which came next in the creation myths of the later Egyptian dynastic Enneads. In these later accounts of the nine gods of creation, the Ennead, there is the god Shu, the light of nature, and the goddess Tefnut, the waters of nature. Shu and Tefnut are nearly identical with the Eros and Eos here hypothesized for the Paleolithic creation myth. It is only after the first five deities have produced the creation that the mythic Ennead of the tribal cavern differs from the Enneads of later dynastic days. The theoretical Paleolithic Ennead here given next includes pairs of serpent and vulture deities that must have been worshipped during the primeval epochs when these creatures first became domesticated. The serpent gods Set and Isis. The vulture gods Horus and Nephthys. Paleolithic Ennead without nature. Osiris, the horned night hunter, and Nu, the goddess of night. Shu, the god of light and air. And 
Tefnut, the goddess of dark and water. Set, the serpent god, and Isis, the serpent goddess. Horus, the vulture god, and Nephthys, the vulture goddess. That this must have occurred can be seen from the fact that so much of historical Egyptian myth contains anthropomorphic serpents and birds of prey, such as vultures and hawks. The other remaining four deities of the historical Enneads represent more abstract concepts such as eternity, instead of these more tangible creature totem gods hypothesized for the Paleolithic. Octoad, Ennead of Kamenu. The Octoad, Ennead is composed of ancient forms, names, and attributes of the gods Nu, Eros, and Eos. Nu and Nu, the primeval waters creation. Hehu and Hehu, the elements fire and air, infinity. Kikui and Kikui, the darkness, dawn and twilight. Kere and Kereha, the night, latent material, or energy. This then is the theoretical Ennead pantheon of the tribe to which the serpent priestess discoverer belonged, and they most likely lived in a cavern somewhere on the western side of the Nile. It must have been the western side of the Nile, somewhere in the hill country beyond it, because this is the mythical location of Lord Set's realm of death. Quarunian timeline, showing the position of the Quarunian tribe Lake Noeris at the start of Neolithic agriculture some 9,000 to 7,000 years ago. The Egyptian myths of the Thuat underworld place it in the direction of sunset where the sun god disappears into it at nightfall. Serpents and reptiles abounded and were by far the most numerous and dangerous types of demons that the sun god encountered in his nightly journey through the other world of dead souls. Serpents and reptiles abounded and were by far the most numerous and dangerous types of demons that the sun god encountered in his nightly journey through the other world of dead souls. The Hydra Serpent seven heads was a chief of the snake demons and this was a description of Lord Set in his starry kingdom of the northern night sky.
ancient Egyptian constellation of Kapesh, or the thigh, was this zone of the night sky ruled by Lord Set, and it was composed of seven stars. Today, this constellation is known as the Big Dipper. Lord Set was given this group of stars to rule not only because of its resemblance to a serpent, he was this constellation of stars because it was a northern constellation as well. In Lower Egypt was the kingdom of the serpent. Even still another reason this is Lord Set's zone of starry night is because of the lunar series of Sept or Set. The sum of the numbers from 1 through 7 is equal to 28 and this is the number of days in the lunar month. Lord Set's constellation of stars is composed of the same number the sacred lunar number of Sept. The Hydra Serpent of the Thua had seven heads. Therefore, the ruler of the Egyptian underworld was Lord Set. There are 28 nights in a month and 13 moons in a year. legendary war between Lord Set and Horus that brought about Egyptian unification into the dynastic Old Kingdom was due to the Paleolithic myth of the world's creation by the god of day and the goddess of night. Thousands of years had passed since the serpent priestess had made her great discovery of crop planting. The serpent god and serpent goddess of the crop fields had become the most powerful deities of Lower Egypt and the Delta, where the cultivation of the soil yielded the greatest harvest. Elder God of the Hunt and the Sun was still most powerful in Upper Egypt, where cattle herding and ranching had never been entirely superseded by crop raising from a less fecund soil. There in the region of the Solar Horned Hunter, the primeval deities of the air, the vulture and the hawk, scavenger and bird of prey were likewise still popular from having been always the creatures of day and sun. The very reverse was true in the more fertile farmlands of northern Lower Egypt. Lord Set's kingdom was the land of night and the moon, a region of dark waters and swamps, teeming with snakes and reptiles, where the Nile emptied into the sea from many headwater channels. The horned hunter of the sun had eventually become horned cattle rancher of the sun, and cattle were still bigger than farming in the upper land. The serpents of the moon still planted their egg seeds in the dark fertile soils beside the Nile, and the 
earth was made even more fecund with the blood and flesh of swine offered to them. The legendary war between Lord Set and Horus was then a religious and economic war of supremacy between horned cattle ranchers of the sun and swine farming corn huskers of the moon. The war between Lord Set and Horus, or between Lower and Upper Egypt, was fought in the prehistory of the sixth millennium BAS, most likely several hundred years before the dynastic period starts. It is thought to be the war that eventually resulted in the later Egyptian unification. The solar worshipping minions of Horus triumph, and in the centuries following succeeded in unifying the country into one kingdom. The gods of day defeated the gods of night, and the solar deities of Ra and Horus and Osiris became the predominant gods of a unified Egypt. Venusian Timeline Showing the first war of the moon and the sun occurring before the start of the dynastic period around 5000 BAS Anu had defeated Nu gods of night continued to exist, though their importance experienced a great decline and continued to decline as the centuries passed into oblivion. The main exception to this was the goddess Isis, the serpent goddess herself, who was revitalized as the wife of Osiris, the new lord of the dead sun god of the dead in the new revamped Thuat of Solar Myth. The goddess Isis, the serpent goddess herself, who was revitalized as the wife of Osiris, the new lord of the dead. Probably some while before Lord Set was made into the entirely evil god that he eventually became, and the worship of night, or Nu, kept on at Sais in the Delta under the form of the goddess Neith, huntress of night, until the visit of Herodotus. Worship of night, or new, kept on at Sais in the Delta. Under the form of the goddess Neith, Huntress of Night. As for the priestesses, shamans, and zealots of the serpents, it is unknown what became of them after the war. As 
just for the priestesses, shamans, Zealots of the serpents. It is unknown what happened to them after the war. Crete is the largest island of the Mediterranean Sea and is nearly halfway between Egypt and Hellas. It is nearly halfway between Egypt and Hellas. Excavations at Knossos by Sir Arthur Evans in the first part of the 20th century have shown that the Cretans of the Neolithic had extremely close economic relations with mainland Egypt. Numerous finds of pottery and artifacts from the Nequata phase and earlier of Egyptian prehistory have been found there in great numbers. Evans even went so far as to speculate that Egyptian refugees were the settlers who had built the first palace at Knossos. Sir Arthur Evans Early Minoan I pre-dynastic, megalithic palace wall. Building debris filled area. Middle Minoan Bronze Age dynastic palace wall. Legendary King Minos may have been an Egyptian Aeneas of Lower Egypt and Assetian. Perhaps he was a prince of Lower Egypt's royal house who fled to Crete after the war between the moon and the sun was lost, escaping with a large number of his retainers, may not have decided to rebuild the Setian dynasty on this largest of island colonies. Evans thought there was a good possibility that some scenario such as this might have happened and the first palace was built upon the site at the start of the early Minoan I phase or somewhat before a period of Cretan archaeology that corresponds to the end of the pre-dynastic in Egypt. This, of course, might help to explain the many similarities existing between the civilizations of Crete, Hellas, and Egypt. Tangencies in the arts, crafts, and religion.
contingencies in the arts, crafts, and religion. The goddess Nyx. The goddess Nu. Lord Set rules Gnosis. <laughs>